I'd like to call this Environmental Advisory Committee meeting to order. We'll start with the land acknowledgement. We are acknowledging that the Anishinaabe lands on which we live and work are the traditional and Treaty 20 territories of the Chippewas of Georgina Island. As a municipality, Aurora has shared responsibility for the stewardship of this land while recognizing that many nations whose presence here continues today. We further acknowledge that Aurora is part of the treaty lands of the Mississauga of the Credit, recognized through Treaty 13, as well as the Williams Treaties of 1993. A shared understanding of how rich cultural heritage that has existed for centuries and of how our collective past brought to us where we are today and will help us walk together into a better future. I've never had to read that one. Thank you. May I have uh, an approval of the agenda, please? I can't see anything, Linda. Um, so would anybody like to uh, make a motion to approve the agenda? Can you hear me? I'll move. Thank you, Carl. Barry, I'm gonna put you a second for that motion. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Okay. Um, any questions or comments on the agenda? Okay. I'll now call the vote. All in favor? Folks, where are your hands? <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to say that's carried. Declarations of pecuniary interest and general nature of there. Are there any declarations? Seeing none, receipt of the minutes. May I have a motion to receive the meeting minutes of May the 4th, 2022? Would somebody care to move that, please? Linda, I can't, are you there, Linda? Yes, yes, Mr. Um, I can't, okay. I could see the screen if I moved it, but if you see anybody's hand up, will you please tell me? Sure. Oh, so would anybody like to move a receipt of the minutes? Thank you, Ashley. Through you, Madam Chair, if um, it might be more efficient if whoever puts their hand up actually just says your name. So Ashley or Sam, just, just call out your name. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Is anybody calling their name out to second? Sam. <laughs> thanks, Sam. All those in favor? Okay. Uh, delegations, we have no delegations. Matters for consideration. Um, we have a memorandum from the Energy and Climate Change Analyst. Read the Climate Change Adaptation Plan and Implementation Plan. Um, so Lisa McTavish is going to, she's an advisor, climate risk and resilience, and uh, Jane Maloney, climate risk and resilience analyst at WSP. Welcome. You have 10 minutes for your presentation. Will that work for you? Hello. Yes. Start. 10 minutes will be great. Thanks. Okay. You may start. Great. Let me share my screen. Excuse me, folks. I just have to find my glasses. Thank you so much. Okay, can we see this? We can. Great. And I can see you. Okay, so thanks again for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, I'm Lisa McTavish and I'll be presenting uh, today uh, for the second time on the climate change adaptation plan, but this time focusing on the implementation plan and the recommendations that came out of that. Um, and so in the 10 minutes, I'm going to go through super, super quickly, um, just a refresher on what we did, uh, and then really just dive right into the findings. To do that, we're gonna present the top risks because that's important, um, and then the recommendations that came out of that. And then after that, looking forward to discussion with everybody. Um, and so again, just the purpose of this project was to look at current and future climate risks to the town of Aurora, 
um, and ultimately to propose some adaptation measures um, to look at you know, where vulnerabilities might exist now and in the future um, and what actions we could do now and in the future uh, to mitigate those risks. So again, a refresher on risk assessment. We are looking at the likelihood that future climate conditions may exceed our um, infrastructure's capacity um, and also the consequences should those impacts occur to ultimately get a risk score. Obviously there was a lot that went into that, which we talked a little bit more about last time. Um, but just to refresh everybody that, you know, we looked at a whole bunch of town owned infrastructure and potential climate hazards um, that could interact with that infrastructure to end up with a bunch of potential risks and um, really just rated and prioritized these. And those fell into three major categories, low, medium, high. Um, a lot of our risks fell in the medium category and that is further broken down into low, medium and high. Um, and what I wanna highlight here is that the risks that we identified for the town of Aurora's infrastructure fell within this medium category here, medium and low. We're not going to discuss all of the low risks um, because we're really more focused on those that could have a higher impact to the town. So I'm going to now get into our results. And so I will do this by looking at the four different infrastructure categories, um, parks, linear infrastructure, water, um, and facilities. And um, what I'll do is I'll present some of the highest risks so that we have context to what, where the recommendations came from and then what the recommendations were. And another thing before I do that, that I wanted to just highlight for everybody is that a risk assessment is slightly different than some other consultant reports that you may have seen in that we are looking at the, we are looking into the future and there is uncertainty there. We're looking at things that could potentially happen with climate change. And of those things that might happen, we are ranking the ones that might have the most significant impact. From those things that have the most significant impact, we are identifying some ways that we could mitigate the impact or reduce the risk. Now, operating a town, uh, operating infrastructure, there's always going to be risk in operating that kind of infrastructure. Um, and so I guess what I wanted to highlight is that the recommendations it aren't like a checklist of, you know, we must do everything, but rather these are some things, these are some areas where we could start to focus our efforts to ultimately reduce the risk that the town might have with respect to climate change. So with that, I will dive into parks first. And so just to highlight some of the highest risks that we had identified in our study, um, we were looking at playing fields, either in flooding or dry conditions as a risk, um, looking at you know, storms and high temperatures impacts to landscaping, um, and also potential future impacts to outdoor ice rinks as temperatures warm. And so here are some of our short-term recommendations. So things that could be considered um, or acted on sooner rather than later. Um, the first two here relate to storms and um, trees and landscaping. And it's about proactively, you know, tidying up um, old trees and also um, afterwards, you know, maintaining areas where there could be hazards due to storms. Um, another one in the short term, um, another important one is about incorporating natural capital assets into asset management planning. Um, and an important step to get there would be to build on the work that was already done in 2013, um, the study on the value of natural capital assets um, so really updating that and working to include those assets in asset management planning. 
once it's included in asset management planning, um, the value that those assets bring to climate change and climate mitigation um, can really be measured and ma managed. Now getting into some of our medium and longer term uh, recommendations for parks um, would be to look at infiltration for um, parks, for sports fields, um, if that becomes a problem. Um, also landscaping, you know, the viability of different species may change in the future um, and looking at ice rink management if that becomes an issue too. Going on to linear engineered assets, um, of course, flooding is the biggest risk that came out of, of this one. We're looking at the roads and the stormwater network. Um, so for roads, um, flooding of roads and sidewalks, potential damage from freeze thaw, um, and power outages impacting our traffic signals. For the stormwater network, flooding and really just exceeding the capacity of the stormwater system is the biggest one. Um, and also high temperatures, summer impacting storm water management ponds. So the recommendations that came out of that are to look at infiltration and you know, doing what we can to plan for that um, on the lot level. And then also looking at um, maintenance procedures, you know, inspection, uh, pro preventative maintenance and uh, responsive maintenance to the stormwater system after flooding. Um, and then, you know, also looking at and expanding on studies that were done um, for flooding to consider climate change um, in those studies. Um, and then making sure that our wet ponds are able to function in hot temperatures. I'm gonna have to move a little bit faster just for time reasons. So I'll- If you need more time, you may have it. Thank you, Wendy. Um, okay, well then I will continue at this pace <laughs> um, and go through the medium and long-term adaptation actions for the linear engineered assets. Um, so erosion has been studied in the town of Aurora. Um, you know, looking at or looking at actually implementing those actions that were um, recommended there and, you know, making sure that some of these areas won't be exacerbated by increased precipitation due to climate change. Um, stormwater management ponds um, was mentioned in the previous section as well. Um, erosion of paths is also um, a recommendation. Uh, to consider this as needed. Again, as I mentioned, medium and long-term recommendations are things that may be considered um, as things become an issue. Moving on um, just with a few more here, um, looking at water infrastructure. So this is water distribution and sanitary network. Um, for the sanitary network, our risks were similar to the stormwater system in that um, flooding water can infiltrate the system and potentially overwhelm it. Um, also, dry conditions could potentially lead to odor events. Um, for the water mm. supply in the water network, um, during hot, dry periods where water is, um, where conditions are more dry, we may have um, water pressure reduction. Um, and also extreme storm could impact some specific infrastructure across the town. Some of that in the water network includes booster stations. Recommendations here are really to continue the good work that's already being done um, for emergency planning um, to make sure that water supply is resilient to um, storms and other issues. Um, and then just, you know, being proactive when floods occur um, to inspect and maintain equipment. In the longer term, um, sanitary backups. I know this is something we discussed with um, town staff. Sometimes good idea, um, there are some difficulties with that, um, but that's something that a lot of municipalities are moving towards, um, sanitary backup systems. Um, <clears throat> also, you know, understanding the capacity of the sanitary system and in terms of potential for overwhelm. Um, otherwise, temperatures at booster stations um, and other infrastructure areas as we'll discuss in facilities, making sure that we are prepared for the temperatures that may come with climate change. 
I'll focus on um, just some of the higher risks just in the interest of time. Um, lastly, we're looking at facilities. Um, here, you know, the town of Aurora is not unique in this one, um, but extreme temperatures and increasing average temperatures, we may have in more frequent instances of high temperatures and difficulty maintaining cooling in facilities. This is particularly important if there are facilities that are used by the public, where some public may be relying on the cooling um, provided by the town of Aurora at those facilities. Um, there's also potential for increased degradation of infrastructure. It's a really long-term thing. Um, and, you know, interactions between facilities and infrastructure and, and storm events, which may increase in frequency. So in terms of short-term recommendations, um, really the biggest one is about cooling at facilities. So looking at which facilities might be critical in terms of you know, being there for the public um, in those high temperature events um, and just assessing the ability to keep up with those heat waves and extreme temperatures in the future. Um, and then you know, if there needs to be some upgrades to equipment to uh, meet those needs either now or in the future to look at that as well. Um, another thing is, you know, increase in storms, lightning, freezing rain, wind, that kind of thing. Um, those may increase in the future and therefore impact our power supply. So if the town identifies certain facilities are really critical for town operations or for the public, um, just ensuring that backup power could be made available uh, for those facilities. So I'll leave it there for the short term. All of this is of course in the report and more detail is provided in there as well. Um, some long-term recommendations um, if you know, uh, air quality and um, lightning become issues, um, those are things that we could look at addressing in the future, but uh, not maybe necessary to do right now. So just to wrap up quickly, again, I wanna identify that um, as part of this study, we did not identify any high risks to the town. So no major red flags um, or actions that are, you know, things that absolutely must be done now to keep the public safe, um, but rather, you know, things that we may see coming in the future that if the town can proactively prepare for, a lot of money can be saved. Um, spending money to adapt ahead of these challenges in climate change um, will save a lot of money um, in responding to those incidents in the future. So thank you very much. I will leave it there. And um, I'm happy to, as we um, get into the discussion, I'm happy to flip back to these recommendations or show the implementation plan itself, which has a bit more detail than what I was shown showing here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I lost everybody. Okay, well, I, I suppose the first thing to ask is, does anybody have any questions about the presentation or any questions in general about adaptation or mitigation? Okay, so again, if, if anybody has a question, could they say their name? Um, could you, I don't think a lot of us are familiar with booster stations, but I think they have pretty high importance. Could you just briefly explain what a booster station is and why it's important? I think Anka might be actually better Anka. to answer that question. Thank you. Hi, Anka. Um, hi. Uh... Hi everyone. So my name is Anka. I'm the manager of engineering for for uh, with the town of Aurora. So um, the booster station, the town has one booster station, and it's not in uh, in uh, functioning right now. But it is important for for the uh, water main system to. Um, to make sure that the pressure in 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 different um, 
pressure uh, section of the um, of the water main uh, system, it's it's uh, it's being dealt with uh, at different time because the pressure system in a water main uh, can vary uh, depending on peaks of the day and and this will uh, um, regulate um, uh, the water pressure in in the system when needed and and the booster station i understand from from the from the plan and from the from the recommendation that we need to have a cooling system in the booster station to to be able to function properly so the temperature doesn't um, doesn't raise um, uh, too much and and the equipment there it's it's being dealt with um so, uh, but booster stations, aren't they regional or do we have responsibility? Um, we have a very small booster station on Vandorf uh, side road and it's not, uh, I think it's out of, it's not functioning right now because it was not needed. However, okay. we did not decommission it yet. The region has um, a lot uh, more booster stations and, and um, uh, bigger booster station than us because their system is a lot larger, but Aurora doesn't have. Uh, doesn't Thank have. you. So I, we better make sure the region of York has a copy of this section of the report. <laughs> um, yes, they have. They have done. I'm their kidding. Own, <laughs> they, their own assessment. And uh, yes, definitely. So with respect to the sanitary system, can it be overwhelmed by flood water? Like it, it can be, and what would happen if it was? Because the sanitary system is important. Yeah, Anka, I can take this one and feel free. <laughs> yes, to and, and I can one. add if there is a need. Okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it is it is a problem that, um, you know, almost every sanitary system has that um, water infiltrates um, from the groundwater or from the surface as well. Um, and so if capacity is exceeded in certain areas, you know, water comes rushing in, it can lead to backups. Nobody wants to see it, smell it, clean it up, you know, that can be, that can be a problem for the town. And so that's why um, that was coming out as one of the higher risks, just because the consequences of that are unfavorable. Yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and the capacity of the sanitary system, the system needs to have enough capacity to collect the sewage and and being overwhelmed by um, rainwater that's that's not what we want to see otherwise we'll we'll have backups into them you know in into the homes and and that's that's a nightmarish situation so we need to make sure that uh the system is not overwhelmed by uh rainwater by flooding so with respect to quality of life for everybody who's sitting here at this meeting and everybody who lives in our town, what, what would you say the most important things that would affect us would be? Or is it just everything's going to affect us? Yeah, I think coming out of this study, it's, it's more those high impact events that will really upset people. Like Anka said, you know, backups into people's homes. Um, you know, it may not happen across the whole town, but to those people where it could happen, you know, that's really upsetting thing. And so I think, um, you know, climate change, we're expecting to see an increase in variability of our um, storms. We could see an increase in intensity and an increase in precipitation on average. Um, and so, you know, our infrastructure systems are designed based on historic um, conditions. Mm -hmm. And so we are expecting to see increases in, you know, as I mentioned, variability and intensity and in precipitation, among other things. And so just to have an idea of how that may impact the town systems um, would help prepare for those conditions and help to um, just, yeah plan for those potential consequences and avoid them. Excuse me, Madam Chair, I believe Barry has a question. Oh, Barry, thank you. 
uh, if I may. Um, the report, the plan actually seems to focus on the uh, infrastructure and services provided by the town. Now, when it comes to the provision of electricity, that's an ele electrical utility that's uh, responsible. Don't right. we have a part to play in that, for example, uh, trees both on public and private land? I mean, uh, we have our, you know, our urban uh, forest, our canopy, but again, on, in high wind situations or ice storm situations, those canopies can have a direct impact on the provision of electricity. Because it's not our responsibility, shouldn't we be playing a part because it's an element of our responsibility, the urban canopy, the urban forest, that can impact the uh, utilities provision of the electricity. I, I, get, I read through the report, I didn't see anything specifically on that. Um, while I'm on it, I got another, another question if I may. Um, the focus seems to be the three seasons, spring through fall. Now, climate change, how is that gonna impact the winter? Are we gonna get more snowfall? Are we going to need more room to store and remove snow? Can we expect greater fluctuation in the weather through the winter season? Um, I didn't see a real address of that aspect either. So two concerns, the provision of electricity, the system, and then the winter uh, provisions. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for those great questions and thank you for reading the report as well. Um, I can answer both of them and Jay, please uh, jump in if I've missed anything. Um, so the first question about um, electricity, from what I can tell, um, the electricity providers are responsible for clearing, you know, clearing the area around the wires, particularly in those, you know, high, um, high traffic areas. Um, in terms of electricity provision. Um, but what you see on the more, you know, municipal rural areas is kind of the bare minimum, um, just, you know, getting to it when they can get to it type of thing. Um, and so from an electricity provision perspective, um, a lot of the focus is more on response time rather than prevention of all of those um, issues. And so, as you mentioned, the town of Aurora has this canopy. And if, you know, power outages is something that the town decides is a risk that we don't want to take or that um, residents are absolutely not okay with, um, then the town can take action on that. Again, it's, it's kind of a, a risk management or risk tolerance question um, because as of right now, um, the electricity provider accepts that there is risk that some of the wires will be impacted and that they will respond as soon as possible. Um, so that's that. I'll, I'll leave it there for that question. Um, unless you have a follow up, or Jay, you want to add anything to that one, and then I can respond to the winter question as well. No follow up on the tree question. It's still outstanding. The winter uh, consumes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the winter, you're, you're right in noting that um, a lot of the concerns are related to, you're right, the three seasons, fall, uh, summer, and spring. Um, what we're seeing with respect to trend, climate trends in the winter is that temperatures are expected to increase, so we're not expecting to have as cold of winters. Um, but what we're also expecting to see is an increase in variability, and so it's difficult to predict. Um, in terms of snow, that is one of our climate projections that is the most difficult to predict. There's, it has the, one of the least amounts of certainty with respect to what we're going to see with snowfall. Um, one thing that we do note, though, is that um, freeze thaw we normally see in the spring and the fall. And that's an issue that you know, we don't worry too much about in the winter because temperatures typically stay cold enough what we're expecting to see in the future with that shift in temperatures is freeze thaw cycles concentrated more so in the winter. And when you have more of them concentrated in the smaller period of time, it can uh, damage infrastructure because of that. So that's one thing we're expecting to see in winter. Um, we also might see more frequent winter flooding. And so, you know, fluctuating temperatures increase, you know, a bunch of snow and then a 
a hot flash or a warm spell um, can lead to winter flooding and that's more difficult to maintain. It's more difficult to respond when there's um, snow and ice kind of getting in the way. So that kind of ties into um, our recommendations around flooding um, and looking at just preparing the infrastructure, primarily storm and, and sewer systems um, to be prepared for flooding in any season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any, any follow up, Barry? Um, just a question. Municipalities uh, currently that are responding to uh, problematic uh, midwinter thaws, are there devices that employ, for example, pressured steam to relieve uh, frozen junctions and uh, pipes? If they do, perhaps doubling up on that because uh, the flash flooding, the flash thawing, whereas down in the ground where the frost is still present, it's going to be frozen up in, in spots, you know, bends and junctions. And they've got to keep those clear in anticipation of the flash melting. So I wondered if uh, that would just be left to the um, to the department involved to make sure they had adequate uh, adequate machinery and equipment to uh, deal with increased rapidity of melting, or are you going to spell that out? I don't know. Yeah, I think um, Anka, you might have more insight to this question, but um, I I haven't heard of municipalities applying that. Um, but of course, you know I haven't done a scan of them. Um, so Anka, maybe you can comment whether the town has had issues with that um, and whether there's any practices already in place. I, I'm not aware of these. Uh, <laughs> that would be a question for um, operating or operations to, to know, but I haven't, what I know, I haven't heard of any issues uh, so far, but I'm not aware of, of, uh, of, uh, of anything uh, like this. And, and definitely the melting of snow and not only that, but um, raising temperature during the winter, it's a very concerning thing because the ground is frozen. And in the summer, you have the, the, uh, the grass and, and the ground, gra the soil is not frozen. Uh, and even if there is an intense and prolonged period of rain, some of it is still absorbed by the soil. When in the winter, the ground is frozen and it acts like an impervious surface, like concrete. And even if it is a shorter and not so intense period of rain can do a lot of damage more than in the summer due to the fact that you know the ground acts as an impervious uh, surface even if it's not paved and or or um, you know with asphalt and concrete surfaces on it so yes that's a very concerning thing but i do not uh, have an answer exactly for your question very sorry because i don't i i haven't heard of any issues that operations might have in in this area so anka is that something you could further explore with operations absolutely yeah thank absolutely. you so much yes thank you um, could I just go back to the electricity thing? You said if, I mean, power failures are terrible for residents. It's something I, I get a lot of emails and calls on. So you said something about, not you, Anka, sorry, about, um, you know, if the town was concerned enough about that, we might be able to do something. What, what would you be thinking that we might be able to do? Um, I think it's it's kind of what Barry mentioned about mitigating potential um, for you know trees and debris impacting wires. Okay. It's it's, but it's not really something that many municipalities would take on because it's really difficult to manage that risk. There are so many residential above ground wires in many municipalities uh -huh. in Aurora. Um, many of these may be underground. And so already the risk there is significantly reduced. 
or what you might be able to do about it um, is significantly reduced. Um, and so, you know, even having a bare wire with no trees around could encounter freezing rain and could fall down, could, you know, be impacted, could lead to a power outage. Mm -hmm. So it, it would be, it would be difficult to manage that risk on a municipality level. Thank you. I agree. Um, and are there any other, oh, sorry. I would like to add something else <laughs> here. Great. Unfortunately, the electricity provider is not willing to uh, change the way that some older areas are built with, um, with, uh, wires uh, and put them underground. We know because when we retrofit a street, when we rebuild a street uh -huh. and we have an open house, residents are coming to us and are saying, we want these um, wires underground. It's a lot better if there is a wind, if there is a, um, a freezing rain, uh, an ice storm, we feel a lot safer that the, we'll have electricity on the street, even in these extreme events, if these extreme events happen. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, electri electricity provider would do that if it is supported entirely by the, uh, by the residents. Mm. And it's the cost is very big, so. Right, thank you. Something to think about. Thank you, Anka. I don't see anybody else's hands up. Um, I actually have. Oh, oh sorry, I, sorry. I, sorry, I was like, I don't know if you can see us, Wendy. I can't, you just have to see your name. <laughs> Thank you. All good. Um, the <laughs> first thing is to uh, uh, Barry's questions about pipes. Obviously, I don't work for the town, uh, but my background in water science, as you say, typically the larger pipes that would be affected by a freeze thaw are actually too deep in the ground to um, truly be significantly impacted because down this far south, it typically only freezes about a meter um, into the ground. So the risk is more in your intakes to buildings and things. Um, for freezing like that, in my general experience, Anka can confirm or deny later on with operation. She's shaking her head, yes. Yes, that's um, correct. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> so that's great. Um, my other, I don't so much have questions as just discussion points around this. I think this report is actually really great. Um, I did read it as this is my day job as well. So, um, but one thing that really I find a concern, which is not in regards to the scope of this report, but more the town should be aware that, especially with this water infrastructure discussion, I'm biased because I deal in water, but um, noticing that for the sanitary system, as well as the drinking water system, the town hasn't done a climate change prediction. They haven't done any climate change modeling. And this flood study of the Aurora's Tannery Creek being done in 2019 means it probably had 2016 data, which without the prediction of climate change. So I just wanna flag that in terms of, we should probably be looking at doing those studies especially since the time that data was collected, climate change modeling has just come so far. Um, and it is a, a minor slip up is a big cost for people and municipality, emotionally um, and actually monetarily. <laughs> um, but I really like those maps. So that was my first just like food for thought moment that got highlighted to me in this report and the second is another food for thought sorry to make you think on this uh, Wednesday evening that um, the scope of this report is built infrastructure and that's great that's excellent 
this is an excellent representation of actions to take on built infrastructure. But I wanna highlight that built infrastructure and municipal assets is only one part of adaptation and one part of climate resiliency. And this is great, um, but reading the title of the climate change adaptation plan for the town of Aurora feels a little bit of a stretch of a title as it only talks about municipal assets really. Um, and in the presentation, obviously we know climate is so much more than that. Um, so those were my only two things that we need to keep a lens on some of the socioeconomic and environmental aspects and uh, mitigation opportunities, as well as our built infrastructure um, and community. But other than that, I, it was a great read. I, I appreciated it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Anka is sure wants to speak. Um, Anka was, uh, did that, the study that may have had the 2016 data. So Anka, can you just talk about um, your study and the work on that? Yes, uh, about the flood remediation study. Yeah. We, we've we done it in 2019 with the most updated data from Conservation Authority. And of course, if we do another one in five, seven years from now, it will be updated with new data. But when it was done in 2019, it was done in uh, partnership with Conservation in authority because we modeled the floodplain and we look at the uh, 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 flooding data that uh, and, and hydraulic model that conservation authority had at that time, the most updated it. And as a result of the study, there was a long list of recommendations that we are implemented, uh, implementing as we speak, um, uh, a long series of capital projects that were all included in the 10-year uh, capital plan to, to be addressed over the, um, you know, up to 2032. That includes um, upgrading culverts in the creek, uh, looking at remediating erosion areas in some creeks that this is very important. And we, did, we, uh, we are in the process of delivering two of or, or, or three projects. We are on, underway with design two projects to remediate uh, erosion and address creek erosion. And at the same time, replace culvert in, in, in some locations where they need to be replaced because they need to be uh, upsized. They do not uh, meet the current MTO standards and we have a timeline to replace them. Absolutely, when we rebuild the street and there is a culvert underneath and that needs to be upgraded, we do that right away. If we don't have a project specifically to rebuild that street, we just go and replace the culvert based on the timeline that was suggested in the flood remediation study. So uh, that's my answer. Thank you. I, th I think we're spending maybe $350,000 a year on that work. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. Um, okay. And, uh, and I can add something else here. Sorry, I mm -hmm. can add something else here. It was a recommendation in, in this climate change adaptation plan. Actually, it was the first one that was put there for, for stormwater implementation of low impact development. That is very important because this means moving the, the, the importance of lot control and, and dealing with stormwater where it falls on the ground and not piping it and conveying it to stormwater management ponds. So you need to put pipes, you need to upsize the pipes more and more because the storms are more frequent, more intense, and the, the duration is, is, is uh, bigger. So if we deal with low impact development and in our capital projects, when we build a street, 
we do have a request from the consultants to look at what low impact development we can provide on that street, swells or, or uh, um, grass swells or infiltration trenches where we deal with storm water where it falls on the ground, not going into the catch basins and sewers and then be conveyed to the creeks in, in larger quantity, creating creek erosion and so on and so forth. So we do that. And also through the green development standards, mm -hmm. we ask developers for new development site plan subdivisions to implement low impact development in their design and, and construction. So that's another aspect, how we plan to deal with, with flooding uh, and, and address the issues of climate change with respect to flooding and uh, creek erosion. Thank you. We're gonna have a lot of infill On, development. Can sorry. we you, use that for the infill development as well? Yes, and the infill development also through porous pavement, through grass swells, through, through infiltration trenches. Um, uh, all these uh, can, be, can be done on, on each and every site plan or infill development. This low impact development can be implemented at, to deal with stormwater. Thank you. Better than before through just, you know, letting it be uh, collected through the storm pipes that need to be uh, right. upsized now into the storm water management ponds that take up a lot of land, in fact. And cost a lot of money. And cost a lot of money. They Thank are you. very nice features on the ground, but there are, they are these features are very expensive for, uh, for the town to maintain. Sediment right. dredging, maintaining the you know right. inlet, outlet, vegetation. It's it's it cost a lot of money to build and cost a lot of money to maintain. Thank you. Um, sorry, did I hear somebody's voice? Yeah, sorry, I, I had a question, Colin. Um, Hi, Colin. Hello. Um, I was wondering if there was any um, thought about encouraging homeowners in the town to uh, have solar panels on their roof and whether they're could be any measures that could be done to encourage that, uh, both as a way to re reduce um, non-renewable energy, but also as a uh, backup to help uh, backup in situations of emergency. Um, yes, uh, there is there is a thought uh, uh, on doing this through the community energy plan. Uh, the town has uh, endorsed. Uh, we, we completed and the council endorsed the community energy plan in 2021, where we have a lot of uh, good and green proposals on uh, renewable energy for not only for the town facilities, for, but for the Aurora community at large. So, so what type of um, uh, measures are taken to, uh, to cause a shift to that? Um, more, more solar, more use of solar. I think we are talking here about incentives and looking. Um, mm. Sebastian, do you do you think you can answer this better than um, me? Well, we, I guess, what I can say about that is we are looking into possible programs such as an LIC, which is a local improvement charge program, which is an incentive that the town will give on the residents to implement energy efficiency retrofitting within their homes. And yes, Colin, this will include solar panels, um, but also just retrofitting the building envelope, for example, um, through a loan. So if in terms of solar panels, yeah, the, this is one incentive that we are trying to provide a business case for, for, for council in the near future. Um, but we're still in the research development phase right now about Great. other towns, Toronto's, if you're interested in, in learning more, Toronto, the city of Toronto has um, their LIC program, it, program, it's called HELP, that's the acronym, HELP program, just look it up and you can take a look at everything they've done um, and the grants that they've, that they've used um, for the residents. I know Newmarket also did one as well. Great. Sebastian, are there um, provincial grants? From what I saw, they
they do there's rebate Enbridge gas for example has rebates that residents can use um i'll have to look back at those um if you look at again the city of toronto website they have all the incentives and rebates that that were available to to the public okay. um there was a there was a federal grant as well I'm trying to remember what it's called now um they used the federal the residents were able to use a federal grant sebastian um, may i ask if you make yep. it easy for us a little harder for you if uh, you might see uh, what federal or provincial grants there are uh, that Aurora's residents could be able to use, or maybe residents, maybe businesses as well. Yeah, I can take a look at that. From Toronto's, I'm, I'm sure Aurora could use the, the similar versions of theirs. I'm sure it, it's provincial wide, but I can look into others as well. Thank you. Well, well, well I just, Anka? I can add, sorry, I can add something else here. Again, Community Energy Plan had a series of recommendations and, and future projects that um, we are undertaking. Actually, we proposed as part of our 10-year capital plan and council will, will listen and, and, and will decide on some of the, uh, these projects and and, and I was looking at what I, what I have in the 10-year plan and one, one project that will come uh, for council deliberation in 2023 is energy retrofit uh, program business case where, where we ask um, to hire a consultant and that will put a plan together for, for, for uh, energy retrofit for businesses, town facilities, as well as residential houses. So we will come in the future with more recommendations and, and we'll look at grants, possible grants. So we have projects coming in the next year to look at, at, at this uh, aspect and how to retrofit and how to, uh, how to help um, Aurora community, Aurora residents in retrofitting their houses and uh, to, to, to be ready to adapt for that. That's very good news. Um, I'm interested about right now because my son just bought a house. <laughs> so um, the other thing, and I was shocked, I heard this on CPT radio and I should know better than to be shocked because I'm sure Barry knows all about this. They were talking about dark roofs and light roofs, what we used to call white roofs. And the, the difference in um, absorption, I think, for dark roofs, it's about 80%. And white roofs, it's about 25%. So just with, um, well, in the summer, I don't know how it would work in the winter, but in the summer, my goodness, we, it would just save a lot of money on energy. And also we would be taking, we would be sending it back out to the environment. So um, I don't know if that's like, it seems like such a simple thing. Is it, am I wrong that it's simple for us to do? It's something we could, most of us Thanks, could Sam. do like right now. <laughs> yeah, Sam pointed uh, it out. It's, uh, it's called the albedo effect. So the higher an, an albedo, otherwise in your terms, Thanks, Sam. Wendy, the darker an object or the darker surface will be. Um, in terms of summer and winter, you'd, ra you'd want to have a reflective roof in the summer. So the radiation will reflect off the surface, yeah. cooling the house. In the winter, you'd want a dark surface <laughs> for your roof so more of the sun's radiation is absorbing through the house because in the winter yes it's not as sunny we normally see overcast cool temperatures but the solar radiation coming from the atmosphere is still at a consistent rate so you're still going to have solar radiation going through the house okay okay excuse Thanks. me madam chair ryan has a question yeah i, just had, a, I just had an add-on to sebastian's comment so um, last Thursday, the federal government announced a $4.4 billion initiative that provides homeowners with a $40,000 interest-free loan over 10 years for items like Ooh. solar, hot water heaters, that kind of thing. So I just sent a link to the group. Um, Thanks. In, in addition to that, they also give uh, $5,000 in grant dollars towards solar, for example, you can get, I think, $1,000 per kilowatt. Um, so if you get a grant, that's great. And if you can't get a grant, you can finance it interest free over, over 10 years. Thanks, so Ryan, for, thanks for that. This is, this is the grant I was just talking about from natural resource Canada. This is what I'm 
doing research on currently. So come next year, when if we get the business case approved, um, we will be working with that grant. That is the grant Toronto used, the Greeners, the Green Homes Canada yeah. grant. Yeah, that's exactly it. So it's actually different. Toronto, Ottawa, and Kingston, they actually have their own city grants that were in addition to this. So they also offer it, I think, $40,000. So you really get $80,000 for climate change. Right which is a well, tremendous amount of money. But um, I think a lot of municipalities are looking at piloting it as well. So I think Aurora, sounds like you guys are doing that too. That would be nice. Um, if, if anybody, um, well, we're all interested in this, um, have a look at Passive House. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the, the Passive House. Actually, they even have an office, I think, in Aurora now. But... Uh, even with retrofitting, you get the most um, effect if you with insulation and windows, because that's where a lot of heat and cooling is lost. So I'm, I'm sure you can use the grant for anything that's energy efficient. But um, it's a very it's very interesting. Unc, are you familiar, Sebastian, with Passive House? Not Passive House, no. But i I've been doing some some research and you have to be careful with the windows and doors because because it's uh -huh. a premium item yeah um some some will not be able to be we're not eligible for financing so i again i have to do more research on that but you have to be careful with the windows and doors wow that's that's interesting not to burst that... your bubble so <laughs> yeah i know if that's what saves which, which produces the most energy efficiency you think that that's what they want to be going for Anyway, um, oh, thanks, Sam. Um, it depends on the angle of the sun. You lose oh. the most heat through windows and doors, but passive heating often utilizes the angles of the sun to best uh, get the most light and heat into your house. It is complicated. Thank you. Okay, so much to know and learn, um, but so interesting. Is there anybody else who would like to weigh into this before we close this item? Okay, then uh, thank you so much. Um, this has been a very interesting topic. Thank you, Anka. To our consultants, you're off my, you're off my screen. Are you still with us? Yes, yeah, thank you Hi. so much for the very interesting discussion and for the opportunity to present. It's been thank great. Thank you. And I also read the report and um, I've got all kinds of circles and <laughs> highlights to take with me to one of my council meetings, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Linda, I have no idea. <laughs> Madam Chair, could we have a mover and a seconder, please? Oh, a mover and a seconder to receive, that would be great. Thank you. Could we have Thank a mover you. and a seconder to receive the report? Should we have had that in the beginning, Linda? Yes, next Sorry. time. Next time, so we better have a mover and a seconder now. To, re um, to receive the report and to receive the comments from the committee. To, thank you, received the report and receive the comments. Um, okay, I'm gonna pick the people I see on my screen. Crystal, you can be the mover if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Lisa, would you like to second this? Oh no, you can't. <laughs> Ashley had her hand up. Ashley, thank you. I thought you were gone, you guys. <laughs> okay, all those in favor. That passes. Okay, on to the next item. I need to go on to my e-scribe. Okay, we have a memorandum on the corporate energy plan, the progress report. Um, is anybody presenting on this, Linda? Yeah. Oh, you will, Sebastian. Thank yeah, you so much. I will yeah, be presenting it. Great. I'm just going to share my screen now. Does everyone see this? Um, I'm coming back to you. Oops. Uh, yes, thank you. Awesome. OK, everyone, just a reminder, my name is Sebastian Kantaran. I'm the new climate change and energy analyst for the town of Aurora. Um, I'm going to just take a moment of your time tonight to go over our corporate environmental action plan, um, specifically our annual progress report. 
um, for 2021. So a brief overview. So our corporate environmental action plan, also known as SEEP, is a five-year plan that outlines environmental sustainability action items uh, directed at the staff at, co at the corporate level. Um, it serves a twofold purpose, one in a community lens. Um, it serves to protect and enhance the natural environment, uh, promote sustainability, integrity, and conservation of resources. And it creates a practice of, of environmental stewardship within the community. And as a title corporate, it also provides a purpose to the corporate lens um, to corporate direction to provide corporate direction on key strategic environmental initiatives to be imp implemented over the next five years, as well as assist council to plan for and implement specific actions to improve the town's environmental performance and sustainability for future generations. So this report was approved and developed in, in July of 2018, just to remind. So the development of these annual progress reports, it starts off with a, a coordinated approach to implementation that includes all of the departments at the town. Um, so you have engineering, waste management, parks, facilities, corporate communications. We all, they all come together and we've created a tracking sheet which has been included into this meeting um, as attachment two. So this tracking sheet is essentially an Excel spreadsheet that allows all town staff to implement their successes or objectives that they've accomplished throughout the year that meet the objectives of SEEP. And it's essentially a good way to monitor progress and encourage accountability by all staff. So after a period after an open window of data input, the climate change and energy analyst essentially goes through the list, um, refines and reviews the inputs that were made. And then we develop this progress report that goes through a summary of all the successes that the town has, has achieved throughout this year that meets the SEEP objectives. The SEEP themes, uh, we, it consisted of six themes where objectives um, are introduced. Uh, so we have water conservation, sustainable urban development, waste reduction and diversion, biodiversity and natural heritage, climate change and energy, and environmental awareness. So last year, as we all know, we've, there was many challenges faced as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and still currently. Um, but it's important to note that all town staff continue to effectively implement the SEEP, their SEEP objectives. And just for the interest of time, I'm going to provide a few slides of some of the successes that the town has seen over the course of the 2021 calendar year. Um, a more detailed summary is included as attachment one, but just for, for your interest, some highlights here. I think one of the highest most successful things, in my opinion anyway, was the adoption of the electric vehicle charging station policy. Um, this allowed the town to take another important step towards decreasing the community's greenhouse gas emissions through the transition towards an electric fuel exclusive corporate transportation fleet. Um, town operations changed 315 water meters in 2021 as part of its water loss reduction strategy. Um, interesting enough, because we were just talking about low impact development techniques, it has been applied during construction of the 2021 20, road reconstruction project. So things such as bioswales and enhanced oil and grid separators were used in those, in those projects. Um, for waste and waste management, council approved the bag tag program. So this program aims to educate residents on proper waste disposal practices and increase townwide waste diversion rates. And the next one here, the town actually increased its diversion, diversion rate of waste um, by 66%, um, which it surpassed the 2018 base year rate by 1%. So we're on a very good track in that sense. It was also recorded that there was a total of 1900 trees and shrubs planted across rural lands from parks and natural heritage. Um, in terms of the adopt a park program and partnership development, it was confirmed that there was a 13th partnership made um, through Herb McKenzie Park, which was another 
another successful achievement. Just going back to the EVs, um, after the approval and implementation of the, pol the EV pol charging station policy, the town had partnered with Ivy Charge and installed eight dual head level two chargers at town owned facilities with proposed actions on installing two additional chargers as part of the library square project. Um, in terms of town owned facilities, um, they've demonstrated a 14.5% reduction in energy consumption compared to 2018 metrics. Um, town solar rooftop systems generated 613,727 kilowatt hours of electricity. And over the course of 2021, the facilities has integration of operational changes um, internal from town-owned facilities in an effort to reduce energy consumption. And because of these changes, 23% um, of energy avoidance was, was a result. Corp or communicate, the Corporate Communications Division last year, they implemented two campaigns, one of them involving the anti-idling campaign and every second counts, as well as two Go Green challenges. Um, one of the Go Green challenges was community-based, and I believe it was held in July. Um, and the second one was town staff-based, so it was corporate-based, and it was held in the fall. So this is actually happening again next week. Our next Go Green challenge community-based strategy is going out next July 1st is, is the start of that one. So we're underway with that one again. And then this final one, we've developed and enhanced LLD strategy. So LLD is an invasive species that has dominated within Aurora. And just to dive in a little deeper there, the strategy includes monitoring robust communication plan, burlap kits, and watering and injection treatments of selected prominent trees. So th this successful strategy was, was developed and in my belief, soon to be implemented. And that's just a, that concludes that. That's just a, a handful of objectives that the town has seen last year. Wow, that's, thank you so much. It's very encouraging. Um, this is an old, uh, the corporate, the SEAP is, I don't, can't remember, but it's been around for quite a while, but there were never any, um, departments or, or people responsible for the various initiatives and uh, it was something that I was trying to get done and um, that's something that I think Natalie was instrumental in doing because if you don't have anybody taking responsibility great ideas and I can I see the results of it and it's excellent would you say that staff is interested in doing this uh, is we you know, we're kind of forcing them. Are they interested? Are they really excited about it? I think we're trying to bridge the gap on climate literacy within the town. I know yeah. we've, we've implemented a climate change consideration guide that all uh -huh. staff are using in terms of their staff reports. So we're trying to right. build a stronger education towards climate change internally. Thank you. I, I have to say I'm sometimes disheartened because when I go to the town hall, which is usually on weekends or in the evenings, there's so I walk around and turn off lights and it's just a small thing. But um, anyway, there's always more work to be done, but I think this is a lot of progress. Does anybody um, on the committee want to comment on any of the initiatives that Sebastian was describing? Uh, I, I have a question, uh, Wendy. Thanks. Uh, Sebastian, I'm wondering with the ivy, has there been any monitoring of how much it's actually being used by anyone? Uh -huh. um, because I have to be honest, I um, never see it being used. And I know other towns have charging stations and they might charge you for, for parking there. You put your money in a meter or something or use a credit card. Um, but this, I think you have to set things up with your cell phone and I just, I don't see anyone ever using it. Um I do, we do have, a, I do monitor the usage and again, still going through that process now, I do it uh, quarterly. So 
I don't have exact numbers now, but I mean, they, they have, they are being used. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you let us know when you do your next update because Ryan, I'm, uh, you know, sorry, Colin at the town hall. I mean, we used to go for meetings. I used to go for meetings every week and at least once a week. And I guess there were people using it sometimes, you know, but yeah. yeah. The town I would, hall I one, it's... I wonder if it's different too. Is the town hall one you can just plug into or do you actually have to go through Ivy? I, uh, you know, it's an older one. You're right. So so maybe you just plug in. Um, uh -huh, I'm not familiar with the Ivy except for the fact that we approved them. But it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Look forward to Sebastian's uh, information on that. So, so you're, what you're saying is maybe it's, it's just too hard or too... I, yeah, I just wonder, and I don't know what the cost would have been to do it ourselves or would be to do it ourselves and how, how, how the profits are dealt with. Or So I understand uh -huh. we partnered, but I don't really understand the details of the partnership. And I don't, I don't know if it's encouraging people to use electric vehicles. Um, Thank you. So Sebastian, keep that in mind when you uh, come back to report to us. Thanks. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, um, I'm going to assume that we're finished with this. Thank you, Sebastian, for that update. Thank you, Councillor. Um, again, I have to go back to my e-scribe. Okay, so again, Linda, there should have been a motion. So a motion to receive. Um, who would like to do that? Thank you very much, Colin. Anybody else who I can't see? <laughs> Linda, you can see everybody, right? Sam. Sam. Thanks, Sam, Sam will second. Sam will second. Thank you. All those in favor? Great. Back to my screen. Um, thank you. The, the last thing on the agenda is a roundtable discussion. Um, so, um, Linda, I'm sorry, I've gone off eScribe again. A roundtable discussion on, on just generally. I could speak to this one because I'm the one that Thank requested you. it be added. Oh, um, yes, of course. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so basically, the reason I asked for this to be added is I've noticed um, just along trails in Aurora, um, residents kind of cutting holes in fences, planting vegetation in um, environmentally protected lands. And uh -huh. I was just curious as to if that's something that the town is tolerant of or what's kind of what's the town stance on that? What are the repercussions? What's the enforcement like? Is it reactive or is it proactive? Um, when I tried to call the town just to learn a little bit more, I didn't really get a clear answer. So I wasn't sure if it's something that was really a matter um, or not. So just, just want to bring that up here as a roundtable discussion to see kind of um, what the tolerance is for that kind of stuff. Um. I'm going to, I mean, Sebastian is at a disadvantage because he's quite new. Um, it would not be proactive, first of all. Um, it would be through bylaw, uh, which, you know, is very busy. Um, I, I'm sure it's not something we want to tolerate, but then how, you know, the question, oh, Uncle, are you going to say something or are you just... <laughs> Thank you, Anka. Go for uh, it. Yes, I'll I'll try to answer because okay. I looked into this since you know it was put on the agenda. With I I looked into into this issue and I I try to provide an answer now. Uh, there is the parks and public places bylaw, and in okay. this bylaw there is section nine that that speaks to encroachments, and. Um, and another section, section 39, that states that to um, install a gate in, in a, into a fence that abuts a uh, town's open space, yes. you need a permit. And yes. this permit would be issued by Parks Division. And we don't issue many permits. <laughs> no, because the, the, these open spaces and, and environmentally sensitive lands, these lands should be protected. It's Agreed. not 
it, you don't go there and change the grade and, and start digging or, or uh, putting fill or, or changing the elevation. So that's not acceptable and uh, needs to be protected. And of course, if there is a fence between the, you know, the public lands and, and adjacent properties, this needs to be respected. You don't uh, uh, put a gate or, or if you want to do this, you'll go to the, to the parks division and you make an application, I understand, but they will look at why you want to have a gate in there. And I don't think that's easy to get approval for, uh, for such a thing. Thank you, Anka. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for bringing this forward because, um, well, it's just wrong. But, um, and it's also should be pretty easy to find the culprit. So, <laughs> so, um, uh, so it would be all of our bylaws are complaint driven. So somebody needs to complain to bylaw. And would it be would it be building bylaw or would it be? It will be it will be uh, if there is a complaint to bylaw, I think the bylaw officer will go and visit the site. And it's, it's your correct counselor, uh, Gardner, it's difficult to find the culprit. However, they might put it on their um, agenda and take, um, you know, and keep an eye on, on that to see if something happens. But I'm, I'm looking at the section nine of the parks yeah. and open spaces bylaw that says, no person shall encroach upon or take possession of any park of public place by any means whatsoever, including the construction, installation, or maintenance of any fence or structure, the dumping or storage of any materials or plantings or planting, cultivating, grooming, or landscaping thereon unless in accordance with the municipality encroachment policy and authorized by council. So if something like this happens, I, I assume I, uh, bylaw will, uh, will look into it and, and try to, you know, to remove that uh, gate uh, and restore the fence and, and see if they can uh, find out who's encroaching and, and what's doing into the open space or park or, or, or environmentally sensitive area. These, these areas needs to be protected and I think bylaw will keep an eye on it. If there is a complaint, absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you. Ryan, I think what we've been kind of circling around this issue in council for years because what's happened over the past, you know, in the older parts of town, people have slowly started to encroach onto the lands and it's, it's in existence and it's happened a long time ago. But in, so it's, it's a difficult issue. But in the newer areas, um, you know, you can, you can see that it's happening. I mean, all the neighbors would see that it's happening and they would, um, it, it's the issue is, you know, are you you're going to speak up uh, against something your neighbor is doing? But it's, um, but also it could be, it's very obvious who, Anka, I was making a joke before you didn't get it. And it's because I make bad jokes. <laughs> so, um, you know, because the, you know, you can see it's it's the homeowner who's doing it. You know, hopefully it's hopefully it's, we can see it that it's it's not too big a mystery. Where some bylaw issues are very difficult to figure out. You know, because somebody does something and then they leave. Um, so, I'm assuming um, Ryan that this is an issue that you've seen. And um, um, do we did we give you enough information? Um, and do you have any suggestions as to what we might, maybe, maybe we want to communicate this out to the public through our communications channels. Um, certainly, you know, people may not know about the fence, about the, the gate part. That, that, you know, I could understand that, but doing anything else, I mean, they must know that it's not their land. Um, is, is there... 
Is there any feedback you want to give uh, staff or me? It, it helps. I wasn't sure if it was reactive or proactive enforcement, so that's definitely helpful. Um, and yeah, it's pretty obvious when you're going along the trails, you can, everyone can see it. So, um, I don't so want anybody the, could report. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to be the guy that you know, <laughs> reports it to anybody, but I was just curious as to how it works. And then my other question is around encroachment. So is there any rules? I know some jurisdictions have it. If someone, um, encroaches on land over a certain amount of time, it becomes their property. Is there anything like that? No, that's what makes sense. Anka's shaking her head no, uh, and I never, yeah, it's like the squatter's bylaw, right? No. I don't it, it, well, it's a good question, and it's difficult <laughs> to answer. <laughs> um, we always look at legal, and we ask legal input on these. For uh, example, we uh, I'll give you an example when we had um, uh, to rebuild a road, and and on that road um, there was a business that was encroaching into the municipal right of way with the concrete pad uh, that he was needing for his business. It was a garage, and for years. Years, I mean like 25, 30, 35 years, because we don't go and rebuild a street every five years. We go on a street and then uh, when the street is new, we go on a street and rebuild it after 40 years or, or right. something like this. And then when we rebuild the street, that business and uh, owner wanted to keep that concrete pad there. So, and there was no, um, uh, encroachment agreement with the town that was not no, no permission from the town at the time so we worked with the business owner and with legal department and we had an encroachment agreement oh. and because because approved by council it was years ago because that that encroachment didn't uh, didn't create any issues on the municipal right of way and it was so old and his business was set up in such a way that he was counting on that concrete pad but not it's not all the time when this happens if right. there is an encroachment that impacts the municipal right of way and the maintenance of the right of way and the operations division um, that needs to maintain the right of way and there is no encroachment agreement with conditions, we remove it and, and is not reinstated. So it's a case by case. Uh, Thank you. Brian, does that help? Yeah, very helpful. Yeah, and your, I think your suggestion was a good one, just general education um, through town channels. Yeah. So you think it's worthwhile, but um, I was just curious more than anything, so that's why I was I, I asked for it to be Thank you. And, and I right know, sorry. No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> just, to, just to wrap it up, the discussion with encroachment, if it, there is an old encroachment that 20 plus, 20 plus years, and if that a uh, person goes to council and explains and the staff doesn't have any reason that to say that impacts the municipal uh, activity, council will always decide on keeping the encroachment if it's such an, such an old and no issue encroachment. But again, I'm repeating yeah. myself, not always. That's not always the case. We try to avoid encroachments. I don't like encroachments, especially, you know, uh, in, into easements or into municipal okay. right of way. I'm always against those encroachments and staff, it's, it's against encroachments, but uh, there are cases when, uh, when they can be permitted. Hmm. Uh, and uh, you know what, as you said, in some cases, it just makes sense. But what, what's happened over the years is that a lot of backyards keep getting a little bit bigger and bigger all the time. <laughs> so, and, you know, it's, there's a lot of those. And it's, a, yeah, it's hard really to know what to do about that. But um, just further to your comment, Ryan, you know, I don't believe there is any municipality that has proactive bylaw. I mean, I think sometimes bylaw officers were driving around and they, they see something and, you know, but we just couldn't afford it. It, it would be impossibly expensive. So um, that's why it's complaint driven. And in, in this case, I mean, uh, I can see that 
especially now that we're public with this meeting, this may not be something that, that you would want, but uh, to, to um, speak to Barla, but, but for all those people walking on the trails, the trail that, that you know, that keep to the rules, um, you know, hopefully one of them will report it um, because it's just not right. Thank you. Um, that was, thank you for bringing, and if anybody would like to have a special topic discussed, um, yes, just let the chair know and uh, we'll see if we can work it out. Um, okay, I'm going to go through my screen. Um, Sebastian, I wonder, um, is that something you could speak to communications about? I think, to, I think your name is Carly Smith, about um, just public information about, you know, not being able to put gates into fences that back on public land. It's called public land and parkland, I think you said, Anka. Uh -huh. Yeah, just one sec. I have it. Let me just look. Parks and uh, parks and public places bio. It's parks bio number four seven five two dash zero five p. So An old bylaw. Yeah. Four seven. Could you say it one more time, please? Four seven five two. Yeah. Dash zero five dot Thanks. p because it's Thanks. in park. So this, this, oh, I see, thank you. Zero five means it was done in 2005. Yeah, probably. So old. it's an old one. It may be something that we want to update, but I have a feeling it's probably a pretty good bylaw from what you've read, Anka. Um, it, it's just one of those things that's hard to enforce. So just, um, you know, through our um, various communication ch channels, just maybe to pick a couple things out of that bylaw that the public, yeah. Okay, terrific. Um, I think that's, Linda, what are you gonna do with me? This, we should have had a mover. <laughs> Gee, a mover, and, I haven't done this in so long. A mover and a seconder for a receipt of this motion of this um, discussion item. Um, you, yeah, I was just going to say, Brian, why don't you move it? <laughs> okay. Um, anybody like to second it? Barry. Okay. I can't second it because I'm chair. Barry, Barry has second Barry. Thank you, Barry. You know how this works, eh? Um, terrific. All those in favor? Thank you, that passes. Um, are there any information items from the committee? Excuse me, uh, Madam Chair, there is uh, one item, 8.1 Environmental Advisory Committee update list. Oh, thank you. Okay. And that, that's, just to be, that's just to be received for information. Um, are, are there any comments on that? I don't have any because I didn't see it, sorry. Um, okay, I don't see anybody who's raising a hand or speaking. So we'll just uh, receive that for information as well. Um, I'm, I'm on the Lake Simcoe board and what the chair does, which makes me crazy, is he picks people to move and second motions, which, you know, you're supposed to have people just you know, do it if they want to. But for the sake of time, I'm going to ask Ashley to move that and also put you on the record. Is there anybody else who hasn't moved or seconded a motion? Crystal, I think you have, right? Yeah. Okay, then I'm going to give it to you, Sam, if you don't mind. Thank you. All those in favor? Great. Um, I didn't see any new business on the agenda, Linda. Do we still have new business at committee? Do you, Madam Chair? No, we don't. Okay, then um, who would like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting at a fairly respectable time? Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ashley. Call thanks, Ryan. I'm sure your hand was up too, Barry. Just couldn't see you in time. Are you calling? Okay, all those in favor. 
great. Um, Linda, is this isn't our last meeting, is it? Yes, it is. Oh, oh my goodness. So I'm sorry, Rachel's not here. Um, it's, it's really great to have public participation in committees. There was a time when um, there was a term when there was um, an undercurrent of dissolving the committees and uh, not just not having any. And I caught wind of it and um, I was able to pass that information around. And lo and behold, we still have committees <laughs> because the public wanted them. So, um, you know, counselors are just counselors. We, you know, we don't have any particular qualifications to, to be the, you know, the leaders. So it's really, really great to have public participation. And uh, thank you all so much for volunteering your time. And um, gee, <laughs> well, excuse me, a great summer. So are we, are we officially adjourned? Uh, we already had the motion and then I went on a bit. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I, I, I thought it might be the last meeting, but it's, I'm still caught by surprise.